Hello everyone and thank you for joining me today. My name is Gavin Beerman and I work in the Java platform group at Oracle on the design of new features for the Java language and platform. The aim of this talk is to give you a picture of some of the directions that we're taking with the Java programming language. To do this, I will cover some recent features that we have added and show you how they fit together. With that as a start, I will continue by showing you some of the things that we have planned for Java in future releases. I will be manning the Q&A window during this talk, so feel free to ask questions and I will try my best to answer. I work for a large American software corporation with a lot of lawyers, so I'm obliged to show you this slide. However, for a talk like this, it's really important. Much of this talk is future facing, so who knows what might happen? So please don't bank your company's future on anything I should say today. Even though this talk is about Java futures, I'd like to start with a few words about Java's past. Java 8 was released in 2014. Java 9 was released in 2017. These major releases were extremely difficult to deliver on time because they included so many large novel features. Since then, we've adopted a release model where there's a new Java release every six months, like clockwork. We call these feature releases. Of course, the number of features in a six monthly feature release is smaller than in an old style major release like eight or nine. But as it turns out, we can deliver a reasonable number of features in each release. So over time, they add up. Using feature releases gives you all the new language library and VM features and all the current performance and security patches. Thanks to pressure from users, many tools and frameworks have realized that feature releases are not major releases that will take years to adopt. We often see popular tools and frameworks announcing support for a feature release before it goes GA. We've got a lot of projects going on in the Java platform group, and here are some of them. Of course, we are an open source project, so you can see details of everything we've got in flight online. But today I'm going to be talking about Project Amber, which is a collection of features that we hope will make developers more productive. If you go to the project webpage for Project Amber, you will see that the goal of the project is to explore and incubate smaller productivity oriented Java language features. Most of these features, as you'll see in this talk, aim to simplify data oriented programming in Java by avoiding the boilerplate that people hate and keeping the type safety that people love. Project Ambo has been pretty productive so far in cranking out new features. Here's a timeline. Ambo has been taking advantage of the six monthly release cadence I mentioned earlier by previewing features before deeming them final for the rest of time. Preview features ship in the GA release and are specified in the Java standard but they're disabled by default, so there's no risk of anyone using them accidentally. As an example, we previewed switch expressions in Java 12, re-previewed them in Java 13 with some changes, then standardized them as a final feature in Java 14. Let's look at some of these preview features. First up is record classes, which shipped in Java 16. We've all written classes like the one on the left many times. Class point is a simple data carrier for a pair of immutable integers. We love how in Java, we give this class a name and then our points are type checked in the program, but we all hate how much boilerplate we have to write. We write accessor methods as we would like to make the two integer fields private as good programming practice. We have to write an equals method so we can compare two values. We have to write a hash code method so we can put points inside certain collections. And we have to write a two string method so we can print points out. This is a real pain. Even if our IDE writes this for us, we still have to read it. If we ever have to evolve the class, we'll have to reread and double check all the boilerplate code again. Records finally give us a way to say just what we want. The declaration on the right hand side is entirely equivalent to the one on the left. We declare a record class called point and state between the parentheses 
that there are two integer components, x and y. That's it. But to use it, it's as if you had written the declaration on the left. Let's take a look at it in action. First, let's put the declaration at the top. We create instances of the record class using the new expression as expected. The signature for the constructor of a record class can be simply read off from the declaration of the record class itself. In our case, to construct a point, we need to provide both x and y values. No other constructor is provided automatically. Record classes automatically provide an accessor method for every record component that returns the value of the component. All components of a record class are immutable. Any attempt to mutate them results in a compile time error. Record classes come automatically with those three important methods that I mentioned earlier. First, they come with an equals method that compares the instances by their component values. Second, they come with a hash code method, and also they come with a two string method. Now there's a lot more record classes are just special sorts of classes. You can define your own methods just as you would expect. You can write your own versions of these important methods too. You can even write your own constructor if you like. And we even give you spe some special compact syntax to do it. On to another feature, sealed classes that shipped in Java 17. Sealed classes and sealed interfaces restrict which other classes or interfaces can extend or implement them. This provides a more declarative way than access modifiers to restrict the use of a class or interface. A class that is sealed can declare explicitly which classes can extend it using a new permits clause. The subclass of a sealed class may be final, like circle here, or be sealed itself with its own list of subclasses, like rectangle, or be non-sealed, like square, so that anyone can extend it. The non-sealed modifier really does have a hyphen in it. It's a hyphenated keyword. Evolving the Java language often means new keywords for new features, but new keywords risk breaking old programs that use them as a variable name or a method name. We invented hyphenated keywords to solve this problem. Why are sealed classes important? Well, we use classes and interfaces, and importantly, inheritance in Java to model data. But even though inheritance is core to this notion, we have very few ways to control it. Previously, a class would be either final and couldn't be extended, or it, could be, it was open to extension by anyone. With sealing, the class writer can themselves restrict inheritance and specify with the permits clause exactly who can extend them. A pattern that we see commonly when using sealed hierarchies is where we want to say that an interface has a fixed number of implementations that are themselves final. We can use record classes for those final classes, or record classes are implicitly final. So we often see code like this, where we have sealed hierarchies and record classes combining to form something very useful. Now, this pattern is no accident. This is what uh, functional programming languages were called an algebraic data type. And now we can model algebraic data types precisely and compactly in Java. Switch expressions were finalized in Java 14. Prior to this feature, Java only had a statement form for switch. This was very limiting, so we decided to add an expression form. Here's an example. You'll see that the switch is on, a, on the right-hand side of an assignment, so therefore it's an expression. You'll also see that in the switch block, after the case label, we have an arrow, not a colon. This is a new sort of clause that can appear in the switch block. To the right of the arrow is an expression. So, for example, if the value of the day was Tuesday, 
then the value of the switch expression as a whole is the value to the right of the arrow, namely seven. Now, actually, there are two further things hiding here in plain sight. The first thing is exhaustiveness. If we comment out the Tuesday clause, this switch expression is invalid and the compiler will give us an error. This is because in Java, an expression should always have a value. By removing the Tuesday case, there will be no value. As the compiler can spot this, it's a compile time error. The second thing that's hiding in plain sight here is that there's no default clause. The compiler has been clever enough to work out that this is a switch over an enum. And as it sees a clause for every enum constant of that enum class type, so the switch block is exhaustive. Therefore, no default is needed. Before we leave our switch expression revision, here's another point that we'll come back to in a few, few slides. The selector expression, the thing you switch over, has to have a particular type, both for switch statements and switch expressions. It must be a char, byte, short, or int, or their box forms, or a string or an enum. No other types are permitted in this position. One of the big themes of Project Amber is pattern matching. This has involved multiple jets which stack up on top of each other, and there are more to come. The jet that I want to explain in detail is the one adding pattern matching to switch. But first, I need to do a quick recap of patterns and pattern matching. So let's look at type patterns, which were finalized in Java 16. A type pattern itself syntactically looks like a variable declaration, and that's not by accident. What is different is the semantics. A pattern embodies a test. Pattern matching is the process of testing or matching a value against a pattern and determining if the value matches the pattern or if it does not. So in our case, the test is whether a given value is a string or not. A side effect to pattern matching is that we can initialize variables if the pattern matches. In our case, if the value is a string, then the variable s is initialized with that string value. In Java 16, we enhance the instance of expression to use pattern matching. So on the right-hand side, you can write not just a type, but also a pattern. Let's look at an example. I've highlighted the pattern here for you. This code asks if O is a string. If it is, then the pattern variable S is initialized with that string value. That means that in the true block, the conditional, we're free to use S, no casting is needed. So a variable in a pattern is very much like a local variable. It's just that it's initialized not by assignment, but via pattern matching, which is an inherently conditional process. We've made the compiler super smart about this conditionality. You can't use a pattern variable unless the compiler is sure it will have been initialized, for example, in the then block of this conditional. Clearly, the pattern variable won't have been initialized in the else block. So if you try to use S there, it would be an error. Great, so that's the revision over. We know what a type pattern is. We know what pattern matching is. We know all about switch expressions and switch statements. Now we can look at how we're gonna bring patterns to switch. We'll also see our friends record classes and seal classes too. Pattern matching for switch is a preview feature in Java 17 and also in Java 18. In a nutshell, we'd like to allow patterns to appear as a label in a switch block, as in this example. The semantics of such a pattern enhanced switch is clear. You test the selector expression against the pattern. If it matches, then that clause applies and we execute the code on the right hand side. So obviously, as the pattern's matched, we'd expect to be able to use the pattern variable on the right hand side of the clause. Here, we're using the uh, string s variable in the print line method call. Now immediately, something jumps out at us. 
recall that the selector expression, the thing we're switching over, is of a restricted type. Now, we're not going to be able to write very many patterns, therefore, the only uh, reference types that we can use are enum types and string. So we're going to have to lift that restriction. So for pattern switches, you can use the integral types as before, char, byte, short, or int, or any reference type. The next question we're faced with is determining which pattern matches. Here are some examples. In the first one, it's clear that there's no overlap between the pattern. Uh, so there's no way that the value for O could be both a string and an integer. So there's nothing to think about. If it's a string, the first one matches. If it's an integer, the second one matches. But consider the, the other two switches. And remember that in Java, all strings are char sequences. So what do we do if the value of O is a string? Which one matches? Well, there have been languages that attempt to do some sort of best fit pattern matching, but it turns out that this is not such a successful design. So we have made a decision that pattern labels are tested in the order that they appear in the switch block. We think this makes it clear to developers what is going on. But given that, clearly some switch blocks are going to be broken. If we take this one, for example, the pattern label string S will not match anything because all strings will have matched the char sequence type pattern. We say that the char sequence pattern label dominates the string one. Clearly, this is a programmer error. The string uh, label is clearly unreachable. So this is a compile time error. Let's look at some other features of pattern switches. Obviously, it's going to be useful to have a pattern switch that also uses constants as labels, like this one here. The first clause matches the string hello, and the second one matches any other string value. Now, given what we said a couple of slides ago, clearly we couldn't order those clauses the other way around, because in that case, the hello label would never be reached. So this again is a compile time error. Now, no language feature in Java uh, doesn't uh, get complicated by null. So you'll be relieved to hear that that's the case for pattern switch too. We have a complication with null. Currently, switch is very strict with respect to null. If the selector expression evaluates to null, then every switch throws a null pointer exception. This is reasonable because we didn't allow you to switch over very many reference types. But now we're lifting that restriction and now you can switch over every reference type. It's no longer reasonable. We don't always want the switch to throw a null pointer exception. So what do we do? We're going to provide a new label that you can write in a switch block written null which can be used to explicitly match against the null value. This is cool because now your defensive null checking code, checking code can now move inside the switch body where it always wanted to belong. When we experimented with this, we found that in a number of cases, we wanted to do the same thing if the value was a null or if it matched a type pattern. So we allow you to write them together in a single case label. If we look here, the case label case null comma string s matches if the value of the selector expression is either a null or a string. And in both cases, the pattern variable s will be initialized with the string value of the selector expression. You'll remember from our revision that switch expressions have to be exhaustive. So obviously that's going to have, have to carry over to pattern switch expressions. So the example on this slide is clearly in error because the pattern switch is not exhaustive. It only has cases for strings and integers. Luckily, it's normally very easy to make a switch expression exhaustive. You just add a default clause. 
Now, we've made a big call. Since our users have been playing with switch expressions, they've told us how much they love that the compiler checks for exhaustiveness. So much so, a number of them have asked us to uh, add this check to all switch statements. Now, we can't really do that because that would be a massive breaking change. However, we can get close. If your switch statement is a pattern switch statement, we've decided that the switch body must be exhaustive. So in this example here, this is clearly a switch statement and it's clearly a pattern switch statement because the labels have patterns and it's therefore in error because it's not exhaustive. It has a case for string, it has a case for integer, but it's missing cases for the others. And again, it's easy to make it exhaustive, just add a default. Remember those seal classes from earlier? Turns out that they come together with pattern switches in a really nice way. You'll, we recall here the uh, sealed hierarchy of shapes from earlier. And in our method, we are switching over a value of type shape. Now, according to the declaration of shape, there are only three permitted subclasses of uh, class shape, that's circle, rectangle, and square. So the compiler can infer that no default clause is needed in this switch expression because all the subtypes are covered by the switch block. Now I can't resist showing you some stuff we've got brewing and we've spoken about this uh, in some white papers. So if you search for it on the web, you'll be able to find some, some discussion documents. And so hopefully these are features that are going to appear in JDK 19 and onwards. Here's a pattern that comes up often when we're writing pattern switches. Here we have a clause uh, that uses a pattern to match all integers, but in the body of the clause immediately, we have this big conditional, which is looking at the value of the integer. Now this mix of control flow is quite hard to read. And what this example program is really trying to say is that there are three clauses, one for negative non-zero integers, one for zero, and one for positive non-zero integers. And we'd like to ha have this uh, declared more explicitly. So we're going to propose to support a new form in switch blocks to support exactly this. We call this a when clause, and it essentially serves as a guard to a case label. For a case uh, clause to match, the value of the selector expression must match both the pattern and the guard. For those worried about efficiency, we are working on making the compiler smart enough so that it will optimize this switch block so that the type pattern is only tested once. Remember our friends, the record classes? We'd love for them to play even nicer with patterns. We even have a JET for this already, JET 405. Hopefully this will appear in Java 19. We propose to add a new sort of pattern, a record pattern. What is new about a record pattern is that it doesn't just check whether a value is of that record type, but it also deconstructs the value to get at its component values. For example, if we have a record class declaration for point, as on the, in the middle of this slide, this pattern tests whether the value is a point and then initializes X and Y to the two components from the declaration. Now, the cool thing about this is that patterns can be nested uh, inside record patterns. So let me walk you through an example to see how this works. We have a uh, record class color point, which contains another record class point. Now consider this code. We have a outer pattern match uh, switch to match a colored point. And then inside the, the clause, 
we use an excessor method to get the point value out, and then we use a pattern instance of to check that it's a point, and then we are able to print out the components we're interested in. So let's try simplifying this code. The first thing I notice is we're using a type pattern for a record type point, and then we're also using an accessor method. Now we just have introduced record patterns to simplify code like this. So let's replace this with a record pattern, like so. Okay, so that's great. But in fact, there's another instance of a record pattern here as well. Here, we've got a test type pattern for colored point, and then we have uh, uses of the accessor methods. So we can replace these with a record pattern also, like so. So, okay, so this is already looking good. Uh, we have two record patterns, but there's actually more to do here. If we look at uh, this pattern variable P, all we do with it is use it in another pattern match against the, pat the record pattern point into X in Y. Why can't I nest the record pattern inside the other pattern, just like with nest constructor calls? No reason at all. In fact, we support this. So here it is. Let's look at the pattern in the box. It's asking whether a value is a colored point containing a point which has components X, Y, and there's also the, the color coordinate C, component C. The nesting of the pattern matches the nesting of the type declarations. We're used to nesting constructor and method calls. Patterns are no different, we can nest them as well. What's fantastic about this code is quite how compact it is. Indeed, just like uh, the Sherlock Holmes story about the dog that didn't bark, the real point here is the code that you don't have to write. Let's write this code without any pattern matching at all, just using instance of, uh, using types, casts and method calls. It's pretty ugly. And there is actually some nasty embedded null checks that you better not forget. All of this is completely implicit in the pattern matching code. With patterns, you just concentrate on the positive code you want to write. All the nasty null resilient navigation code gets done for you by the compiler. And we always want the compiler to do the boring but tricky work. You may ask, why are record classes so special? Why do they get special patterns? Well, the answer is because they're very restrictive. We always know how to deconstruct records and how to pull them apart. We always know what they contain. Now, we'd love to get all classes in with the pattern love. And we think we know how to do this, but obviously it can't be automatic. They're not restrictive, they're very general. Um, so we're going to have to provide a means for people to declare how pattern matching might work for instances of their class. Now, I don't have uh, time to explain how this might work, this topic of many talks to come, I suspect. Um, but we have plans and you can um, search for them online about how we can allow all classes to support pattern matching. Okay, so I'm pretty much out of time. So let's wrap up. Project Amber is bringing many new features to help make developers more productive. One of the big themes is pattern matching, which is generally thought of as one of the superpowers or functional programming languages. And we're bringing this superpower to Java one piece at a time. So in type patterns, patterns in instance of, pattern switch, record patterns, classes having general patterns and so on. And I'll just finish by saying that Java is evolving fast. So please get involved. Please download Java 18 today and try out the features that I've discussed in this talk. Thank you for your time.